It's lovely to see you all here today. I, I, think, I think probably most people would know me, but just in case, my name is Simon Crouch. Uh, I'm here because John is doing uh, the service in Strathdon. Psalm 9, verses 7 and 8. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. So it's lovely to see you all. Um, you can tell the temperature is going down because the jumpers come out. Not as if I like looking like a backgammon set, but still, it's, it's practical. So it's lovely, lovely to be here. And again, lovely to uh, welcome you here in the church and anybody that's watching the live stream or the recording of the service later on. Uh, here in Afford, of course, the service will be followed by refreshments. So I do hope that you'll be able to, to stay for that. This is Christ the King Sunday, which is the final Sunday in the liturgical calendar. So the theme of Christ the King runs through our service this morning. Now the feast of Christ the King was introduced in 1925 by Pope Pius XI in the dark days between the world wars. Uh, he felt that it was time to call on Christian people everywhere to declare their allegiance to the rule not of men but of Christ. So, the feast day of Christ the King was born. So we're going to come together and worship God this morning. Our call to worship is on the order of service that you got, or I think it's going to be on the, on the screen as well. It's a responsive call to worship. Um, I will say, on the screen, I'll say in the bits in yellow, if you could join in with the bits in white, please. So, God of glory and grace, in heavenly splendor you reign. Our greatest thoughts, sending all worldly greatness, enthroned and almighty. We can approach you in worship only because of your Son. Christ our King came as love for us and won peace for us with our holy Maker. With reverence, we come to worship you, asking for your Spirit's presence with us as we praise you. Holy, 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 the eternal chorus rings out. Join us to those who sing your praises, Lord, your children from every time and every place, as we seek your goodness in our own lives. And we're going to begin our uh, service this morning by singing... A song, a hymn of rejoice. Rejoice, the Lord is crowned as king. So if you follow it in the hymn book, it's 449. Rejoice, the Lord is king.
rather strange experience as I was driving into Afford this morning. Uh, I got waved at by Mrs. Claus and a couple of elves. <laughs> so it's going to be a fantastic day, I believe. So if you're in, involved or go into the, the various festivities, enjoy yourself. It'll be fantastic. And what a lovely day weather-wise to, to do that as well. So um, we're going to have our first reading now. Um, and this responsive reading was between us, we're going to be reading Psalm 93. Again, it's on the order of service or on the screen there. The Lord has become king. He is clothed with majesty. Throned and girded with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Thunder the great water. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Statutes, lords, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless It's really no accident that Christ the King Sunday uh, is at the very, very end of the Christian year. Now we start with Advent, of course, and all the anticipation and preparation for that momentous event, the birth of a human child with heavenly credentials. Christmas, of course, we welcome the babe of Bethlehem, who at Epiphany is revealed as the light of the world. We marvel throughout the year at his ministry, his miracles, and the members of this early church, his body on earth, whom he gathered around him. We watch and wait throughout Lent, share the agonies of his passion and crucifixion and the glories of the empty tomb. We accept with wonder the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And along with those first disciples, invite it to influence our lives. We stand on the holy mountain and watch as he is taken up into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of God from whence he has dominion over all. So throughout the year, we follow Christ's ministry, the ups and the downs, the different stages of the extraordinary events. Now, Psalm 93 is the first in a series of seven psalms underlining the theme of Lord's kinship. The opening verse resembles a creed in which people affirm God's majesty. From on high, God ensures the safety and security of the world. And the psalm reflects the everlasting nature of God. Of course, 2023 was a year when here in the United Kingdom we saw the crowning of our king. Now, at the very start of the coronation service on the 6th of May, a young person, one of the Chapel Royal choristers, welcomed the king with these words, Your Majesty, as children of the kingdom of God, we welcome you in the name of the King of Kings. To which the king replied, In his name and after his example, I come not to be served, but to serve. So here in our service today, we welcome the King of Kings into our lives. And we're going to come close now to him with our prayers of approach and confession. There is a response in our prayers. I will say King of Heaven. And simply the response is, we welcome you. So let us come close to God this morning. Let us pray. Christ our King, seated in the heavenly realm, far above all rule and authority, all power and dominion. We come together in our hearts and minds to worship you. Christ our King, King of kings, Lord of lords, ruler of all. You made us, we are yours. You love us with a love that endures. You care for us and protect us. King of heaven, we welcome you. What other king abandons heaven's 
mystery to meet us on familiar and unholy ground. Fashions creation with pleasure and passion, then trusts it to our fragile faith. What other king comes without an elaborate fanfare, slipping quietly into settle, not in lofty pulpits, but among bags and brollies and Bibles and ordinary folk here in the pews? What other king invites us to come exactly as we are, bustling and busy, half-hearted and harassed, What other king is always happy to see us, even in our reluctance? Always anxious to speak to us, to remind us that we are the special guest. What other king but you, O God? King of heaven, we welcome you. The part of you that gambled with glory to make princes of the poor and provoke the privileged, that chose humanity over monarchy, gentleness over greed, and peace over power. The part of you that picked as a palace a stable, a throne a father's knee, a crown a mother's kiss, and as your kingdom, the world whose servants were friends, whose judgments were just, whose challenge was peace, and whose only command was to love. King of heaven, we welcome you. Thy kingdom come, O God, is what we pray, but still we place ourselves above others and above you. Still we abuse our position and bend the rules to suit ourselves. Still we look down on others, when what we need to do is to look up to you. Still we claim as our own a creation over which you labor and weep to see it wasted. Only you know our deep places where hurt and harm lingers. Only you have the authority to excuse our poor attempts at kingdom making. So come among us, God. Raise our heads as a forgiven people. Make us rich servants of your truth and gentle leaders of your people. Confine our dreams of power to working for your glory. Knowing that you are compassionate, merciful, and ever faithful, we ask that you will restore us to fullness of life, to serve and love the world, In Jesus' name. Amen. And now I'm going to ask Alison to come and uh, read for us, please. second reading is from Ephesians chapter 1 verses 15 to 23 and it's from the New Living Translation. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. And the third reading is from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 21, also from the New Living Translation. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. We know that we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world, 
and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is son, the Son of God. And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's Son by his baptism in water and by shedding his blood on the cross, not by water alone, but by water and blood. And the Spirit, who is truth, confirms it with his testimony. So we have these three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. Since we believe human testimony, surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God. And God has testified about his Son. All who believe in the Son of God know in their hearts that this testimony is true. Those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar because they don't believe what God has testified about his Son. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know what, that he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we are asking for. If you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death, and I'm not saying that you should pray for those who commit it. All wicked actions are sin, but not every sin leads to death. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. We know that we are the children of God, and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God and he is eternal life. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Amen. Thank you. So this... This service today really is a service of endings. Now, as we heard earlier, it's the end of the church year, the final week in the lectionary where we complete the, the cycle and begin again at the start of Advent. Also today, we'll be looking at the final in our series of reflections on the first letter of the Apostle John, which Alison's just read out to us. We're going to look in there at the final chapter, the end of his letter to Gentile congregations. Of course, in many ways, we are in a season of endings. Sadly, we've had to see the closure of some of our beloved buildings. Custody Church, at the end of October, Took Church last weekend, Lumsden Church in a couple of weeks' time, and Towie Church early in the new year. And these endings can be very emotional. In both services so far, people were given a memory card to fill in and detail their own personal memories, many from their childhood, of worshipping or being in that particular church building. And in time, we're going to collate them together and bring it all to a record. So this is the final week, the crowning achievement of Christ's life, which the whole church and the whole year builds up to. And then what? What happens after today? Now in German churches, this is called eternity. There is a German word, but I don't think I, I would you know, be able to pronounce it. It's a long word. Um, but it's called, it means Eternity Sunday. So in many ways, Eternity Sunday is the beginning, not the end. And we've, we've travelled through Christ, through his ministry, with his ups and downs. We've reached the crescendo. and just about, Everything is about to start again with the first candle of Advent next Sunday, which is the candle of hope. So we're challenged to think differently. 
to re-examine some of those familiar stories. And we're coming to the time of year, of course, you know, when, when we start to see the familiar Christmas stories come out now. The ones that we could probably shut our eyes and recite without even looking at the book. But those are exactly the stories that we need to look at again, to think differently about it. So Christ the King is the king who wants thoughtful subjects, who doesn't require blind obedience, but is wanting us to question things, to look at things, to think about things, to say, really? And start to examine and go down. And Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, where he says, faith in the Lord Jesus, but also in the love towards all the saints. He recognizes God's place as the king. So I'd just like to, to pause for a minute and just get you to think. What exactly is it that we celebrate on Christ the King Sunday? Is Christ the king of our lives? Now, I'm going to move over here, because I brought a little friend in with me today. Um, and I brought my little friend in a, a seasonal bag, which I thought would be very appropriate today. Look at that. And this is my little friend. This is George. Now, it may be not the best of names for a for a lamb, but George it is. And George is a star. George has appeared in probably more school and church plays and nativity scenes than I would care to remember. Even when my children were small, George was there. So, why is George in today? Now, since the beginning of November, in the Sunday school, we've been thinking about angels. Yep. On Sunday, the 5th of November, we thought about what angels were and, and what they did. Now, last Sunday, we looked at a message that the angel gave to Joseph after the wise men had left, which caused him to take uh, Mary and Jesus through to Egypt for safety, because Herod was plotting to kill him. So that was the thought about Joseph. And today, we're going to be thinking about another message that the angels gave to a very unlikely audience. Have you got an idea about what we're going to be looking about today, then? Any thoughts about... Are we going to be looking at sheep? Well, we're probably actually going to be looking not at the sheep, but the people that look after the sheep. We're going to be looking at the shepherds. Um, and then now, of course, we're going to fast forward a wee bitty, and we're going to fast forward to the very, very start of the Christmas story. So, a question for you. Besides Mary and Joseph, who were obviously there, who were the first people to hear about the birthday of Jesus? Who were the first people? Was it the people in the church? The shepherds, well done. So I believe you're going to be looking at shepherds today and thinking about shepherds. And you're going to hear the well-known story from St. Luke's Gospel which tells us all about that. But I thought I would read you a different story. Um, and this is from a little extract from the Jesus Storybook Bible. Which, and and the, the thing in the Jesus Storybook Bible, which I'm going to have to put my glasses on for, it tells you a wee bit more about the shepherds. So you get to think about the shepherds. So I'm going to read this to you, then, then Seth, I'll let you take this away as well to have a look at it. So God was so happy when Jesus was born. So he pulled out all the stops. 
He'd sent an angel to tell Mary the good news. He put a special star in the sky to show where his boy was. And now he was going to send a big choir of angels to sing his happy song to the world. He's here. He's come. Go and see him, my little boy. Now, where would you send your splendid choir? To a big concert hall, maybe? Or a palace, perhaps? No. God sent his special choir to a little hillside outside a little town in the middle of the night. He sent all those angels to sing for a raggedy old bunch of shepherds watching their sheep outside Bethlehem. Now, in those days, remember, people used to laugh at shepherds and say they were smelly and call them other rude names, which I couldn't possibly mention here. You see, people thought shepherds were nobodies, just scruffy old riffraff. But God must have thought shepherds were very, very important indeed, because they're the ones he chose to tell the good news to first. That night, some shepherds were out in the open fields, warming themselves by a campfire, when suddenly the sheep darted. Oh. They were frightened by something. The olive trees rustled. What was that? A wing beat? They turned around, and standing in front of them was a huge warrior of light blazing in the darkness. Don't be afraid of me, the bright shining man said. I haven't come to hurt you. I've come to bring you happy news for everyone everywhere. Today, in David's town in Bethlehem, God's son has been born. You can go and see him. He's sleeping in a manger. Now, behind the angel, they saw a strange glowing cloud, except it wasn't a cloud. It was angels. Troops and troops of angels armed with light. And they were singing a beautiful song, Glory to God, to God be fame and honor and all our hoorays. Then as quickly as they appeared, the angels left. The shepherds stamped out their fire, left their sheep, raced down the grassy hill through the gates of Bethlehem, down the narrow cobbled streets, through a courtyard, down some step, step, steps, past an inn, round a corner, through a hedge, until at last they reached a tumble-down stable. Oh, they caught their breath. Then quietly, they tiptoed inside. They knelt on the dirt floor. They'd heard about this promised child, and now he was here. Heaven's son, the maker of the stars. A baby sleeping in his mother's arms. So there, if you want to take that and have a look at that, Stephanie, take it through. And so now we are going to, I mean, we have angelic voices between us here, of course, and we're going to sing. Um, and like the angels did on that hillside, we're going to proclaim my God and King. So we're going to stand and sing together. Let all the world in every corner sing. If you follow it in the hymn book, it's 122.
George with you and you can there we go. I'll pick him up later, so there we go. Okay, enjoy your time together. Yay. Wee, well done. We're gonna have a have a talk about shepherds now then, eh? We're gonna have a talk about shepherds. <laughs> Oh, I see you're carrying the boots now, just to be safe. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> now, as I mentioned earlier, this is the final session in our series of reflections on the first letter of John. We started our series on the 10th of September with what I called the executive summary. And over the past 12 weeks, we've split the letter into seven separate <coughs> sessions, or what I call bite-sized chunks. Now, one of the problems, friends, is that we've had a lot of other things over that particular period. So the series hasn't been, we've not been able to build sort of week on week, which is a bit of a shame. In fact, the last session that we had on the first letter of John was on Sunday the 5th of November, three weeks ago, when we looked at the second part of chapter 4. And in all honesty, can we remember what we talked about on the 5th of November? Mm, probably not, I would imagine. Now, as I mentioned before, it's very difficult to follow a theme just through our church services. So again, please take away the, the order of service with you. Have a look through it. And as we've reached the end of that particular uh, letter, then you know we could start maybe to, to refresh our mind by going through. The whole letter ebbs and flows. It's almost in a poetic style, which rises to a crescendo to emphasize the key points and falls almost to a reflective phase to allow the points to sink in. Now, bear in mind that this letter, although we have the written word and we are reading the letter, it wasn't meant to be read individually. It was meant to be written down to be read out. Read out like this, in a company of believers. So John had to ensure that he continues to grab the listener's attention he poses questions and covers contentious points to prompt people to go, whoa, whoa, I didn't say that. So either the listener will agree with John's comments and come back to the fold or turn away. If you remember right at the very, very start, I said one of the reasons for John writing this particular letter is that in the community of believers in many places at that particular time, this is about AD 80, 75 AD 80, um, at that particular time there were a lot of false prophets, false teachers that had different ideas. And the results of that, they were actually drawing people away, taking people away from the established religion into their special or, you know, warped, if you like, version of it. So John's letter was really to say, look guys, this is the truth. This is what happened. I was there. I was with Jesus. I was one of his trusted followers. I was one of his friends. I was one of his inner circle. So would you rather believe me or that lot? Would you rather agree with what I say or with those that were never there and didn't have any, any saying in it? So it was read out in a group. Now, the key verse, I think, which brings it all to meaning is in the one that Alison read out, which is uh, chapter 5, verse 13. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, rather than trying to summarize everything that we've done over the past seven sessions, I thought that what we'd actually do is to bring it together and look at the key themes of the whole letter 
And again, friends, I'm going to leave it to you to have a look at it, to go through it and read it in your, in your homes. And when, you have, you know, when you're sitting there with a cup of coffee, pick it up and have a little read through it. Now, when I was training, part of my training, I remember very, very well the words of a very experienced minister from Livingston, I think he was, who told us that in a sermon or an address, as I prefer to call it, in a sermon, you should just concentrate on three points. So don't make any more because they won't understand and they'll, they'll lose you as you go throughout. So three points. So I'm going to concentrate on three points. But I'm actually, it's actually very easy for me because John has already done that. In his letter, he split things into three separate points descriptions, if you like, of what God is. In the first two chapters, he makes the first point is presenting God as light. And he says that believers can walk in that light and have fellowship with God as Christ is their defender. John urges believers to obey Christ's teachings and to love all members of God's family. Uh, chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. God is light. In the next two chapters, 3 and 4, John, who is known, as we said before, as the apostle of love, he presents God is love. And because of that, God calls us his children and makes us like Christ. But he also warns about the, the false teachers as well. The key verse on that is chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. God is love. And here in chapter 5, which brings everything together, is his third point. And he talks about God as life. We are alive if we live in Christ, who lived as one of us and promises us life eternal. Whoever believes in God's Son has eternal life. He's all that they need. You don't need to wait for eternal life because it's already there. The moment that you believe in Christ, you're granted eternal life. Chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So three points. But in my mind, three huge, massive, so important points that tell about the whole essence of God. Light, love, and life. Light, love, and life. Now, it would have had such an impact on those believers some 2,000 years ago, and surely it has an impact on us today. Now John had already had a special relationship with the Christian community. He'd already seen their numbers reduced, as, I've, as I mentioned about there, where people were being drawn away by the false teachings. So John had not only hoped to bring people back, but also to expose these false teachers for what they were and publicly discredit them so people would not listen to them and would not be drawn away. So the effect of this particular letter and these three crucial points is that it, it drew the community of believers closer together. They realized they were under attack for want of a better word. They realized that others were leaving and they wanted to pull together 
And that was the impact of this particular letter, drawing people closer together. What a hope for us, friends. As we're now three months, nearly three months into our new parish, what a hope that we have that John's letter will have the same effect today. Draw us closer together as we move forward. So if you ever have any doubts about your faith, any questions that you have that you need to find an answer to, then I would strongly recommend that you pick up the Bible and you turn to John's first letter. If you feel that the world is closing in, if you feel that things are getting in the way of developing that relationship with God, then turn to the words of John. His final verse, 21. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. So on Christ the King Sunday, the King of heaven is also the King of our hearts. So now we're going to sing again. The Lord is King, lift up your voice. Um, so it's, if you're following it in the hymn book, it's number 129. The Lord is King, lift up your voice. the notices are on the order of service. I just wanted to mention uh, a couple. Um, talking about your Christmas festival today, you missed a little bit of a, 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 an event yesterday. It was our, we had our, par our final parish coffee morning in Strathon Church Hall. But in that coffee morning there were lots of Christmas things and ornaments and books and whatever it is. 
Um, it was lovely. So many thanks for all those that came along and were involved. Helen, I have to say, thank you very much for all that you did. Rosaline as well for helping as well for, for that. We made a total of two hundred and three pounds and two pence. Now the two pence were because there were, there were a lot of children there, and I think they were putting their pocket money in for some of the books, which was great. So two pence, very very important. Now I have to mention that the. Um, the lift is not working at the moment, so um, if you're finding it difficult to get up the stairs, if you have a word with one of the welcome team, then I think you walk around the outside and up through the, through the, the door there. Uh, on Saturday the 2nd of December, the Fair Trade Group will be holding a Christmas coffee morning at St Andrew's Church from 10 till 12. Again, it's all, the, it's all on the um, order service. Because today is Christ the King Sunday, next week, of course, is the start of Advent, when the start of the church's year. Um, we're going to have the service here, a shared service here at 10 o'clock. And then there's a really special service, if you're interested, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, when Historic Churches Scotland are holding a Carols by Candlelight service, which I'm taking up. Um, um, in uh, Kildrummy Kirk and it's the first of our special Christmas services and there'll be you know um, mulled wine mince pies and whatever uh, served after that so that's next Sunday at four o'clock if the weather and everything is fine in at 6 30 there is the, the gift service here in Afford um, where we'll be welcoming the local scout and guide units. But it's also open to anybody. It's the gift service. Please to receive gifts of toys unwrapped, which will be distributed locally through the North Sounds Radio Mission Christmas Appeal. A little bit further apart, uh, further on the 10th of December, we're having the service of Thanksgiving in Lumsden Church. And that will be the only service that will take place in the parish there. Now there is this Advent book, and I know we have a few people, and I know John has been keeping a note, but we really need to get it ordered today. So if anybody uh, would like a, a copy of it, um, it's the Dawn of, Rede the Dawn of Redeeming Grace by Sinclair Ferguson. Um, and there are, we've have some people already signed up to it, but if, you're, if you haven't signed up to it and you would like it, then please jot this down before you leave the service today. We have a flyer which is um, in display somewhere with all our Christmas services, and please take one away with you. Now, I'm going to say last, but by no means least, those who have expressed an interest in forming the church choir for the parish. We've had one practice, but we're, we have another one this afternoon, then, aren't we? Four o'clock, is it? Four, four thirty. It gives us a little bit extra time. Four thirty today here in, that, in, the, in the room at the top there. And, and again, anybody that's joined the choir and you come along, if you haven't and you're still interested, then have a word with Linda and please still come along. Be, it will be wonderful. I think the hope is... Sorry? There's still time. There's still plenty of time. And I think the hope is that we're going to perform next Sunday, is it? A few of us are getting a bit nervous about that. <laughs> so... Um, now we're going to dedicate our offerings to the glory of God. Now the prayer of dedication is on the order of service, or I think will probably come up on the screen. So as we, we dedicate our gifts to the glory of God, uh, I'm going to invite us to say together, Christ our Lord, your kingdom is unshakable and your reign of love will always triumph. We bring our gifts to you and offer them and our whole life with joy for your service, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Amen. Now, over the past couple of days, we've seen a cessation in the fighting in Gaza, albeit temporary, and the release of a number of hostages. We've also seen an increase in the humanitarian supplies which have been going into the area, thankfully. And as we thank God for this chink of light in the darkest of situations, we must pray for the safety of the remaining hostages and for their imminent release. And so we're going to remember them in our prayers. So let us come close to God.
Let's just pray. High King of heaven, everything that is owes us existence to you. Yet you rule over us as a merciful Father. We thank you that in Christ your reign of love is endless and cannot be destroyed. We thank you that you raised Jesus to life and that you have placed all things under his authority. We give thanks for the community of the church, giving thanks for one another, one another here within our parish and for the family of the church throughout the world. We give you thanks for the ways in which you have blessed us through our love and our friendship of others. You raise the humble and you reach to embrace the outcast. Let all the earth sing of your greatness and our hearts be shaped in gratitude to you, our Saviour, King, Master and Friend. O God of all justice and peace, we cry out to you in the midst of the pain and trauma and violence and fear which prevails in the Holy Land. While we pray to you, O Lord, for an end to violence and the establishment of peace, we also call for you to bring justice and equity to the people. We thank you for the temporary cessation in fighting and the release of hostages on both sides. And we pray that this will see the way for a permanent solution to be found. That the crisis will end without any further loss of life. We pray for the safety of those still held in captivity. May you fill them with your spirit of peace and hold them in your loving embrace. We pray that further diplomatic solutions will be found that will allow them to be released in safety and security. We pray for your creation that groans for salvation, for areas spoilt and desecrated by greed, insensitivity, or by climate change. And we remember all those affected by the effects of the change in weather patterns across the world. We pray for all places of deprivation or great poverty, for people misused, exploited, or abused by others. We pray for all who suffer from war or oppression, and we still hold close in our hearts those in Ukraine who are still living through the ongoing war with Russia. We remember all those who are in difficulties today, the sick and the suffering, the anxious and the lonely, the grieving and the dying. We continue to remember all those who are facing times of hardship due to the cost of living crisis. We pray for all those who are homeless, without shelter or adequate clothing. And we remember the parts of our world which are suffering from drought or from famine. And in a moment of silence, Lord, we pray for all those known to us who need your special love today. pray for all those who are near in the end of life's journey, for those in hospital or hospice. And we pray for their loved ones waiting anxiously at their bedside. We hold close in our hearts all those who mourn the loss of a loved one. Be with them and grant them the comfort and the peace that you long to give those who place their trust in you. Thank you for your promise of abundant grace and blessing. May your kingdom expand and your name be praised in all the earth. And hear us now as we come together in the words which your Son taught us, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we come to the end of our celebration of Christ the King, let's stand and sing our final hymn, Christ Triumphant, Ever Reigning. And after the benediction, uh, we'll sing the usual, May the Lord Bless You. So we'll stand and sing number uh, 436 in the hymn book, Christ Triumphant, Ever Reigning.
creator God, Christ the King, live in spirit, go before us to give light to those who sit in darkness and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Let us go from this place to serve Christ the King with love and compassion. Let us go from this place with open eyes, open hands, and open hearts. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all and those who we love this day and forevermore. Amen.